Good afternoon, everybody. Good. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our webinar this afternoon here at Multicopter Warehouse. We're going to talk about how to compute volume volumes within Pixport Mapper Desktop and Cloud. And so both the interfaces are very similar, but sometimes there are a few different nuances there. So we want to talk about that here today and share with all of our listeners out there on how to get good volume calculations with drones and aerial photography. So if you have questions during this broadcast, please go ahead and submit them here to the screen. We'll do our best to answer them during the broadcast. And then also you can follow up with me afterwards. The last slide will have some contact information. So how do you calculate volume? As we all remember back to, I guess, be somewhere in like middle school or high school, they teach you that the best way to find volume, at least with a rectangle, is to me measure and then multiply the length by the width by the height get the volume of rectangle. And then as you see here on the screen, there are a number of other mathematical formulas and calculations that can be done for different shapes to get accurate volume, volume calculations. And PIX4D takes a very similar approach to this. And in fact, PIX4D will leverage what we call the DSM, or the Digital Surface Model, that's generated during step three to use for volume calculations. So as we look here at the different workflow, or not the different, but the workflow of PIX4D, how you have three processing steps, step one, step two, and then step three. During step one, you create the initial, the initial processing step. That's where the images are getting calibrated, and you end up at the end of step one with your initial quality report and that sparse or automatic high point cloud that's generated. Then running step two, you have the option, or you'll go ahead and you'll create what we call a dense point cloud, and you also have an option of outputting a 3D mesh or a 3D model. The 3D mesh and model don't have any real impact on volume calculations and it's unnecessary output to do a volume calculation, but you do want to have that 3D point cloud in good quality condition. As I say here, as the points are, you want to inspect, review, and edit that dense point cloud generated during step two to remove any what we'll call noise or un unwanted data, if you will. And then also be mindful of what kind of area you're looking to make a volume measurement of. And so you'll want to go through and what we'll say, edit or reclassify any points that are unwanted data points and classify those to what we'll call the disabled point group in PIX4D. And once you've disabled them, they'll no longer impact the um, generation of the digital surface model. And so an example might be if you're looking to do a stockpile that's underneath of a conveyor belt or in the like, um, Perhaps if you look at the demo project that Pix4D provides, there's an excavator sitting on a gravel pile, and you actually need to take all the points that make up that excavator and classify them as disabled prior to generating your digital surface model. Otherwise, the area that is the excavator itself will be included in those volume calculations. Hold on, Aaron. Yes, sir. Is, is anyone else having audio problems? I mean, it's, I'm on a different line, and it sounds okay to me, but I have someone saying that they, they can't hear anything. So, oh, um, not another audio issue. No, I, it sounds fine on my side, but um, okay, Alan, thanks. It's good there. Yeah, Sam, I mean, it's a little soft, but okay. Um, okay, so well, most people are saying that it's good. So, um, yeah, I okay. mean, Sam might have to try, uh, you know, getting into the audio a different way than he was, but I mean, most people are saying it's okay, it's just quiet, but yeah, it is a little tinny. That's a, there are issues with go to webinar lately. I think so many people are, are using it, uh, but uh, so yeah, Aaron, I mean, maybe you can just try and speak up a little bit and because uh, there's people saying it's a little soft, but that's about it. Aaron, are you there? Yes, I'm here and I'm speaking. You can't hear me? Okay, now I now I can. Yeah, if you could just speak up a bit. Okay, so I'll try talking into the receiver instead of the head, headphones here. So as I was mentioning earlier, we were talking about inspect. Uh, we want to go through and inspect and review the point cloud at the end of step two to make sure that point cloud's in good condition and that we're happy with the results of that point cloud prior to running step three, where we create the digital surface model in the ortho mosaic. And that digital surface model will be the basis for all the volume calculations that PIX4D does. And so before we go a little bit further, I want to talk about the differences between what I'll we'll call 2D, 2.5D, 
and 3D. PIX4D is able to generate a number of different outputs that fall into these different categories as kind of what extent the data is. And so in a 2.5D output, if you will, for any given X, Y, there's really only one Z coordinate. So if we look at the image that we see here on the screen, we can see that the, it's kind of, it looks like it's upside down, but the 2D graphic shows how it's just 2D flat on that same surface. There's no rising up or variance there for height. It's all on one plane. Then we see in the middle there where it says 2.5D that those letters are raised up out of the plane and are somewhat three dimensional, but we only see one particular Z or Z measurement for any particular XY coordinate. And so it's important to keep in mind that in true 3D for any given XY, there can be more than one Z value, sort of like the, the data in the very back of that image there where you see the 3D popping up way out of the the data card there, you can see that there are actually um, at least two Zs for each location, or Zs for each XY in that area, the card itself, and then the letters, they stick up and kind of lean out over. So when you look at the outputs created by PIX4D, the orthomosaic image that is one of the most popular outputs is actually just a two-dimensional image. And then as far as 2.5D outputs, we are creating contour lines, digital surface models, and also a digital terrain model. And then we get some true 3D outputs as well. The 3D mesh and the point cloud or .las file is generated. And then any kind of objects that you might digitize, such as a polyline, a surface, or even a base volume surface, those would be 3D objects. We do, we do want to keep in mind that our volume calculations are going to be coming out of that digital surface model that is a 2.5D output, not a true or full 3D output. And so the next term I want to talk about here are the terms cut and fill. And those are in, exca in excavation industry terms. The term cut would be earth that is removed from an area. It would be considered cut or ex excavated earth. And then a cut is man-made cut through high ground. Makes fairly common sense, hopefully. And then a fill is where earth is brought into an area and is considered fill or embankment earth. So a fill is a man-made fill of a low area. And when you're going to do a volume calculation within PIX4D, my first suggestion or recommendation for you is be sure you have ground control points or some kind of a scale constraint, or you wanna make sure your project is properly scaled. It doesn't necessarily have to be properly located with very high accuracy GCP project or points, but you do wanna make sure you have at least um, geotags from the images of the drone when it was flying, or have some kind of a known scale constraint. That way you can validate that the length measurements on your project are true. And so in the project that I'll be showing you guys here in a moment, we have what we call a sky ruler from the Hoodman Corporation that we sell here at Multicopter. And it's a nice five foot plastic tile setup that quickly allows users to determine if the scale within their projects from their UAV and photography is coming out accurately. And then so when we get into the desktop, what we'll do is I'll bring up a, a place here and we'll all go into the cloud here shortly. We'll be able to see a cloud project but when you're drawing a project within PIX4D, you have the option of importing a base file. You can export a base file once you've created it. And then you can also draw an item or draw the base for your polygon that you're trying to create the volume from. And whenever you're drawing something within PIX4D, it's important to remember to use the left mouse button on your mouse. Clicking with your left mouse button will add additional vertices to your polygon. So as it says here on the 3D view, when you start to create a new object, a green point appears beside the mouse. Then you want to left click to mark the vertices of the base surface of the volume. And then with each additional click or click of a vertex, a vertex is created and the volume base is formed. And when you're all complete, you want to use the right mouse button or right click to add the last vertex and to close the polygon to um, create the volume. And so here as we see, when we have an opportunity, and we'll get in, we'll do this here in the software in just a few moments, but when you create a base within the software, you do have some base options that you can specify how you want that base to be interpreted. The default manner in which the base values are interpreted are what we call a triangulated value, where the software will triangulate among the points that you've clicked to create a base surface. And then you also have other options where you can fit to plane or the software will find um, an average of this, sort of not an average, but it will fit a plane to the point you've clicked. You can also then align with what we'll call the average altitude or with the lowest or highest, and you can also cut, create a custom altitude. And this will all make more sense when we get into the software. 
And then we also, once we've created a base in the software, it's important to remember that you do have the option to edit that base or that volume. And so there's two different ways we can go about doing an edit to a volume once we're in the software. The first way is we can use the 3D view of the volume in the volumes view. This isn't quite as accurate, and that's where we'll just click within the 3D view and kind of drag our vertices from our base to the new desired location. But you really need to snap your point then essentially to a point that's already within your automatic or your dense point cloud. And so you really find that the most accurate way to refine your volume base is to use the second option, which is to refine the vertices via what we call parallax among images in the right sidebar of the ray cloud. And we'll show you that firsthand, but we'll go in and we'll click on the view, be able to enter in the ray cloud, go in and look at the ray cloud view. And then in the 3D view, we'll click on a particular vertex to select it. And then we'll go into the ray cloud properties and the window on the right hand side and update our image selection to refine that point. And so what we have here on the screen, I've just popped up, there's a QR code that should be on the screen for everybody. And there's also a small, what we'll call a tiny URL. That tiny URL or the QR code should take us to a project that I uploaded earlier today to the Pix4D cloud that everybody can see. And I do have a, a small note on here. The first note I want to point out is that one cubic yard is equal to 27 cubic feet. And then also eight cubic yards would be equal to 216 feet. We have seen this graphic that I found talking about the volume of dumpsters a dumpster that has the values or the dimensions of 6.8 feet tall by about six feet wide and six feet long and four feet in the front would have a volume calculation of roughly eight yards. And we're gonna see if we can't replicate that volume within the project that you can link to using that QR code or the tiny URL. So I'm just gonna go ahead and go over to that tiny, or the website that should take you, or go to that tiny URL. It'll take you out to the, um, project I have loaded up to Pix4D cloud here. And on the Pix4D cloud site, we can see that we're looking at what appears to be a school bus yard. And this is the location at my local high school here where our kids go to. And so I wanted to fly the area here with the school buses. And it turns out that there's a dumpster here in the back. And so here in the front, you may notice in the lower left-hand corner on the screen, I see it says 4.986. I actually went through and I was able to create a scale, it's not a really a scale constraint. I've just put down that sky ruler we were talking about earlier. So if I zoom in here on that particular item, we can see this red and black tile item that is the sky ruler in our point cloud. And I can see that the measurement that I did on that earlier came up to be 4.98 feet in length. So we got a good quality scaling on our project here. I don't have any additional ground control points, but I know my project is scaled fairly accurately because I'm right with very tight tolerances of the expected five feet here. And so if I move to the back of the, the building here, there's some areas here at the bottom that have some dumpsters. Let's zoom in on those dumpsters just a bit here. And so as I spin this around in 3D, we can see that certainly the dumpsters didn't fully reconstruct along the sides very well, but I do have good data for the top and I do have some data for the side. And the reason that the, the sides of these dumpsters are a little bit more sparse is I can see the name of this project is called bus underscore SG for single grid nader. And so all my images in this instance were taken from a nadir orientation. Certainly I would have gotten a more robust 3D point cloud generated from a double grid, but I was just trying to do a quick data collection here. And so what we can do here within the cloud interface is we'll notice on the right hand side, we have a number of tools here. And so the first tool we have will allow us to make a measurement, a linear measurement distance. And so let's just do a quick test of that. If I do a linear measurement distance along the front of my um, dumpster here, I see that comes out at five point, oops, it was there just a second ago. Oop, my, my screen's doing some odd driving here on its own. Let's try to do that one more time. We're gonna zoom back in. Hmm. Let's try that one more time here. I'm gonna use the drawing tool left click to start drawing, moving my mouse over to the right. And then when I'm done, I right click to complete. Oop. And I seem to be experiencing some odd refresh rates here on my cloud today. Let's try that one more time. Apologize for this snafu. So we're just trying again to do a test measurement along the... Okay, well, let's bypass the, the linear measurements. For some reason, the cloud seems to be giving me some fits here today. Let's just go ahead and do the volume calculation. 
So the volume calculation, you'll notice there is a cylinder type icon in the tools box here. And so with that cylinder type icon, I can click on that. And then I come down into the, the cloud interface here and I simply left click to start drawing. And then I move to the edge of that box. Um, the... hmm. I do apologize I, I myself. And me. It may be because we have other folks interacting with this model at the same time. I don't believe this that should be the case though. But for some reason here, when I try to do a volume calculation, my screen keeps redrawing on my own. I apologize for that. So let's try this one more time here. We're going to orient the cloud so I can kind of see the base area that I'm trying to measure. Let's try to start from the back of the cloud here. The... Try this one more time. I think we may have some other folks interacting with this project at the same time, and that may be why, because I see here it looks as if somebody has created a cut fill volume there, turned one on. I, I created this one earlier, this cut fill volume, I digitized the base here by clicking left click, left click, left click, and then right click to finish. And then once you have the base defined, I can come over to the right hand side, and I have an option here at the bottom where I can calculate volume and you have the option here to set if you use the lowest point, the highest point, triangulated, fit plane, custom or average. And so this time if I just leave it set to say the lowest point, I do a volume calculate, the volume calculation comes up to be 6.25 meters or um, Um, six five meters here, and we can the values of this came out to be when I did my measurements, I came out with right at eight point one two six yards or right within the advertised element. But I have some issues here today. I apologize. Let me go ahead and switch out of from the cloud interface. I'll continue to let you folks work in this cloud interface. I'm going to step over and open up a version of this that I have on the desktop and see if I can't interact with that while you guys while everybody else who's on the webinar works with the cloud data. So here, if we look at our PIX4D desktop data, I have that exact same project area here. And we can see I have my scale air, my scale bar, there are not a scale bar, I did a scale check on the sky ruler over here on the right. And I can see that I got still a good measurement of that polyline initially. Here, my sky ruler came out to be 4.9 meter or 4.9 feet in length. And so if we move back here and check out the back of the area here where we have the dumpster, we can zoom in and we can see in my point cloud here that I have my dumpster data and I've already created a polygon along the bottom here. And what I've done is I've actually gone through on my desktop and I've measured each of my faces. And so I know that the width I'm getting along the back was at 5.85 feet. Along at the front, I measured 6.4, 5.8 and 6.4. So within the desktop environment, you have instead of a, set, a list of tools on the right hand side, we see we have a view on the left-hand side here called volumes. If I go into my volume view, we'll still be within my 3D view here. And we can see then the volume that I calculated earlier for this dumpster comes up and we can see the volume there in red. And the red data that you're seeing now is the digital surface model essentially, or the terrain that's being calculated for the volume. And my volume calculation as I made these um, points on the ground here came out to be right at 216.55 plus or minus 2.41 feet cubed. And so that was right with what I was looking for. I was looking for 216. And it's very easy to draw a, um, a surface value here. If I just use the eye icon here, I, if I click on that, I can turn it on and off and create a new volume now. I'll just create a new volume by clicking on the volume tab there or button. And then I can move my mouse here within the interface, left click to start drawing, come over, left click for my next vertice, move to the back, right click. Oop, I didn't mean to close that one, so I closed that a little bit sooner than I meant to. So what I can do here is I'll just go ahead and delete that and just try to do that one more time. Create a new volume, left click, left click, move to the back, left click. And then once I get the final vertice, then I right click. And now that I've defined this surface, I can look and see that green surface there. And that one actually looks fairly good. It may not be perfectly level, but now I can just use the compute function here. And then the software computes back out the information. And for those little spots that I clicked right there, I got a slightly different volume calculation because I clicked probably a pixel over, over or so. 
And this time I get a volume calculation of 215.51 plus or minus. And so I have the option to go through and check those different options here. Right now it's using the triangulated base. If I use a custom altitude, I can hit OK and then recompute. And I can see my value updates, my total volume value updates there just a little bit. And as I check out the different options I have here, once again, like if I fit to plane, we can see that the, the software is now creating that green surface down there and that's the location of it. Or I can go through and if I choose custom, I can also use this, the mouse or arrow buttons here to adjust the height or altitude with which my base is at. And if I wanted, I could set my base right there, hit OK, now hit compute. And at this point in time, then it would tell me how much my volume is above that particular base instead of at the, the bottom ground there. And so you can get, and then it looks like I have just a wee bit of fill, or yeah, just a little bit of fill volume from right there over to the side, maybe some noise or something. But still, I get a fairly good volume or value back out from, from the software as expected right there at that value that I was looking for with my dumpster at 216 is the value I got previously. So we'll turn that one off and turn my, my, that one back on there. And so it's very easy to also, if you're trying to do a volume calculation, you'd want to make sure you're doing that in the 3D view to get the best quality output. If I switch over and I try to um, go back to my cloud interface, let's see if the cloud interface is going to be a little bit more agreeable for me here today. So if I go out to the 2D input of the cloud interface, as the 2D map here loads, if I try to create a volume for maybe the dumpster right next to the one I was working with earlier, if I just kind of come in here, I'm going to turn off my digital surface model and turn on the ortho mosaic. And so I can see the ortho that I'd created. So I'll use this volume tool again, clicking there. Oop, come in. I can essentially digitize my base. I'm just left click, left click, and then I'll um, right click to finish. Oop, and I can also click the check box check marks there to finish and it'll take it a few moments to calculate but I see here my 2D area is much smaller just 3.4466 meters and three so I've got some different values here so if I change this up actually and go to um, looking instead of looking at this at the 2D view if I switch back to 3D view and zoom in on that project that polygon I was just creating I can see that that polygon I created actually didn't do a very good job of clicking down to the bottom of my of my dumpster there. I can see it's kind of floating up in the middle of my dumpster and that's not really the spot I want it to be at in the long term. So what I can do is I can change and I'm just using the mouse now. I've gone up and I've clicked on the select and modify um, icon for the tool. And now I can actually, you can see that the icons of the polygon have changed a little bit and I have white boxes along the corners and some plus symbols along the sides. And I can actually come in now and just kind of click on that and drag it down and essentially refine or redesign each of these points to be at the spot I want in a 3D kind of interface here. I can move this around. I can see I'm on a plane there now. I can click and drag that down to better location. And I'll get the one in the front there as well. And so at that point there, I've adjusted it a bit. And that, oops. It may not quite be completely the way I want it, but if I hit um, calculate the volume, I can see I get a, a volume there. It's coming up in meters. And so if I change that now to um, from triangulated to lowest, oop, the whole thing just redrew. That's unexpected behavior, and it may be because we have other folks interacting with the cloud here today. I apologize for that. I hadn't planned for that caveat. Yeah, okay, so now I can see that my improved base is right down there on the ground. And maybe I'm not still not quite completely happy with it. I could update that just a little bit. Or I can even come in and change from triangulated and choose a custom base where I can kind of come in then and set that value myself, the elevation base here. So say I want that to be, say, at, right at 5598. So I can set that base and then come down and recompute the calculation and it updates that, that value there. And you do get very good accurate measurements out of PIX4D. As we step back over here for a moment, I do want to talk a little bit about how PIX4D is going about coming up with this calc these calculations. And so the volume is computed, as I said earlier, using the digital surface model. 
And in order to draw a new volume, once again, you have to be sure that you've processed through and created your digital surface model during step three. And so Pix40 Mapper pro projects what we'll call a grid with the ground sampling distance spacing on the base, such as the graphic you see here. If you're trying to find the volume of this green blob, the software creates this grid, if you will, over top of that blob at the same size as the project ground sampling distance. And the software actually goes through and for each individual cell in that area for that grid, it determines a volume for instance I is given v by the formula of V equals LI times W times H. And so the length and the width are equal to the ground sampling distance. And so L equals W equals GSD. And we also keep in mind then that the height or H is given by a formula of H equals Z to the top minus Z to the bottom, where essentially Z to the top is the train altitude and Z B B I is the base altitude. And so the software uses this formula of the volume for each individual cell equals the ground sampling distance times the ground sampling distance times the height. Or essentially, as we said on the first slide, the way you find the volume of an area is by multiplying the length by the width by the height. That's the exact same technique that PIX40 is using here. And then from there, we can we see here that PIX40, PIX40 Mapper calculates the volume of two different calculations of both a cut and a fill. So it comes up with both those that cut and the fill volume. And the cut volume is the volume between the base and the 3D terrain where the terrain is higher than the base. And the fill volume would be the area where the base is higher than the terrain and would require a fill-in, or it's a negative value, essentially. And when the software combines those two values together, then it also produces what we'll call a total fill volume. And the software also goes through and does error estimation in volume calculation. And it does this for each particular cell of, within your project or within the area to be measured. And so the altitude or Z of a particular 3D point is computed with an accuracy of roughly one to three times your ground sampling distance, or that's the accuracy of the Z, X and Y, usually one to two times. So your average error for the height of each particular each 3D point is roughly 1.5 times the ground sampling distance. So the error for one cell of the volume is given by essentially the formula of X times Y, or X and Y and Z, so you get 1.5 times your ground sampling distance is typically the amount of error for the volume calculations. And so the volume error for each cell is given then by a formula where the error for that cell is equal to the length of the cell by the width of the cell times the difference the ZE figure, which is equal essentially then to 1.5 times GSD to the third. And so I'm getting what I'm getting at here is this is how the software is coming about and coming up with its error calculations or error values that it presents when we look within the software per, for a particular volume calculation. If we come back to um, the project we were working on earlier and look at that volume, we can see here in the volume calculations on the left-hand side that it's giving us a total volume of, in this case here, 160.43 feet cubed, or if we actually go back and look at the dumpster volume I created earlier at 216, plus or minus 2.41 feet. That plus or minus 2.41 feet is the sum of all of the amount of error uncertainty given that 1.3 times ground sampling distance for the extent of the area that I was trying to measure. And so that's where PIX40 is generating that error value. And so you'll find that the larger your ground sampling distance is, the larger amount of error you'll have in your calculations. And so it's always best to try to have as small of a ground sampling distance really within reason for a particular project to have the highest degree of accuracy in your measurements. And then once the error for each cell is known, the error for the cut, fill, and total volume are computed by, use, by summing up the error of each individual cell using the formulas we see here where the cut volume, the fill volume, and the total volume error. And so that's really all there that it takes for it. And the degree of error within the volume calculation depends on the spatial resolution of your project or your GSD, as I was mentioning. And it also, the volume error is, determines the accuracy with which each point's coordinates have been computed and therefore determines the volume area. So if your GSD is high, you have a large volume, your volume calculations may not be best to use in that instance. 
and you, you want to make sure you choose an appropriate GSD depending on the height of the volume to be calculated. So if you're just measuring a very short object, you want to make sure you have a very high GS or a very low GSD or a very high high accuracy project to get a good good value there. And so one way to increase the accuracy of the object's value, volume is to increase the amount of overlap among your images. And I typically like to fly most of my projects with about 80% overlap. PIX40 typically suggests or recommends a minimum of 70, um, 75 front and 65 on side. And I usually bump it up to about 80, 80 just to have good consistent results. And so I, I had some issues earlier with the cloud interface, and I'm happy to bring that back up here, but I was curious, the folks who are joining us here today, oh, I see somebody had a question about GSD. And so the GSD is the ground sampling distance for the, the folks who had, a, if there was a GSD question there. Are there any other questions from folks listening in today with any projects you've been working on that haven't come out quite the way you're looking for or you were trying to figure out how to do a more accurate volume calculation from the project? You see uh, Frank's asking, can you use a scale constraint for height as well? You certainly can, but typically <laughs> the pixels within, within the raster that you're creating are square pixels. So when you create a scale constraint in the XY orientation, that would essentially translate to the Z as well. And so it's not necessary that you have scale constraints in both, but you certainly can, yes. And that would be a good thing. Okay, and uh, is there a rule of thumb for accuracy of scale constraints versus GCPs? Well, the GC, having GCPs will provide accuracy, what we'll call global accuracy, or put your stockpile at the right spot within centimeters. But as long as the project is properly scaled, that the length and the width of your pixels are appropriate as far as like I, you have that five foot sky ruler I used in this project to validate that I was getting an appropriate five foot measurement from that. And so really I in a, pro, a shift northeast, southwest by X meters for the whole project won't in, impact really the accuracy of the volume calculation. Now, if you're trying to then use that same base file to then compare of volume calculation from that same spot in a project from next week, then it would be critical to have ground control points in each of the projects. So each project is co-located in the exact same location where the, there is no shift at all between the projects. Otherwise, volume calculations would differ using the same base between projects. And, that was a very uh, good question. Thank you. You see, Jake's asking, uh, which base surface calculation should I use? Triangulated is the default, but would lowest be more accurate? Well, it really kind of depends. Uh, depend, really depends, I guess, on if you can see the base all the way around the object that you're trying to map or model. If you're dealing with a stockpile that has maybe it's up against a building or it's against some other elements that you're not trying to include in that value, then adjusting and using different options might be of some benefit there. But let's go back here into the software. Let's look at each of our options there again. So as we're doing volume calculations here, we have the options of triangulated, fit plane, align with average, align lowest, align highest, and custom altitude. I would typically encourage you to do kind of as I did earlier here. You want to zoom in on your project and really inspect where that base is while you're kind of visualizing things because as I look here I can see that that base right there that I digitized is coming in and is right there at the ground but it's certainly very possible if I go ahead and let's just turn that off again if I want to try to re-digitize a base again it does take some refinement here and if I kind of go through here I can see if I I'm just going to kind of click and draw a quick crude base there in the desktop and so there I've drawn my base but I can see that my base if I spin around here oops I totally missed the mark on where I was wanting to put that. And so here in the desktop environment, what I can do is I can actually step back out to the ray cloud. And whenever you digitize a feature within PIX4D, it creates a, um, or a tie point for you. So I can actually go up and look at my tie points here. And I can see that the last couple of tie points I created, like this one, MTP32, that was the last one I created, isn't in the spot there that I really want it. So what I can do is I can expand my side property window here. And this is how I can get in now and 
edit those particular markings. So let's say I want that marking instead of there in the middle of the image or the middle of the dumpster, I can come over and find one of the images. Let's try this one here. Now I can't quite see the, the area I'm looking for on that, unfortunately. Let's zoom out of my image here a little bit so I can see my images more clearly. Okay, so I can use, I think, this image right here. Oops. So if I come down here to image 764, I'll hit the space bar and that blows that image up to the full resolution. Now I can grab that green X and move it to the spot on the dumpster I really want it. And that would be right down here at that corner. So I can zoom into that pixel level and really determine, yeah, that's right where I want it. And as I come out, I hit the space bar to make that small. And then as I mark now that point in the second image, we'll see that that G ground control point, not ground control point, I'm sorry, that checkpoint, or I'm sorry, tie point will update in all the other models now. So once I come up here, I can actually hit selection and apply. And we can see that that point now has jumped and has moved over here. I've only marked it in two images. It seems like it's still a little bit high. So what I want to do is go through and review my images a little bit more. I can see here's one where it's showing it off a bit. I can move that kind of back in and over and see if I can find some other images that more clearly show where that belongs. And you do want to be careful and be mindful that the images you're marking in that are clear that you can see where that point belongs. So I would move that down. And so now I've updated that in a few images. Let's see if I apply that. If that doesn't bring that down a bit more, it did. Oops, let's go back to there. I think, yeah, you want to select the tie point you're working with here. And I'm just going to review here the marks that I made previously. I think some of them may be, I don't know, there's only five. I'm going to delete that image there. I wasn't happy with it. Let's try to apply. Yeah, that first image I marked, I can see was bad. Now I, that's moved much higher resolution spot. So if I go to my second point now for MTP31, I can see that point back there, and that should be that other front corner. So if I expand this out, this one, instead of being back at that corner, should be way up about like there. Come to a second image. And so this one here, I can move up to that spot right there. Now when I hit apply, we'll see that point move over quite a bit, and I can see that now that it's a little bit hovering above kind of the spot probably that I really want it. So I can come in here and I could actually go through and also uh, yeah, I view this image here. I can see that point's coming in high. If I bring us down and say, no, you should be right there. And so what I'm doing is I'm essentially validating or reinforcing through multiple image orientations exactly where I want that point to be. And so I can update my third point here. And so it's some, the, having good quality images of your project that go all around whatever object it is you might be trying to map or model is critical to get good quality results because you need to be able to see the base clearly enough that you can mark and align these points to the spots that you need or want them. And then so once I've gotten my points refined there a bit, I can see I have the, the base a bit better so I can now hit apply. And if I go back into my volumes, view here. I can see that new volume that I created earlier. I can still come in here. And at this point in time, because I updated in the Ray Cloud earlier, I'm no longer able now to grab that point and drag it down within the point cloud in the 3D edit mode. But you'll find that doing the edits directly in the Ray Cloud, or I'm sorry, in the images themselves really provide more accuracy. So if we hit compute here, and so I got 204, and if we change this up to fit maybe with lowest in this case here, and hit OK, and the recompute. And this time we came in right again there at 216. So sometimes the lowest option would be is a good one to choose, but it's good to kind of experiment with what the different options are, because as you hit um, triangulated there, you can see how the triangulation base is kind of canted just a little bit, so it's not a really flat, perfectly level plane. And you can achieve that level plane by coming in and then just picking either a highest or lowest, because if I choose highest now, we'll see how the entire base kind of adjusted in the view there, or if I fit the plane, the triangulated option. And so you can kind of just really visually inspect and make sure you're getting the base at the location you want, and then you'll get good accurate measurements. There I am again right in at a 216 measurement, which I was looking for for the size of that particular dumpster. I do certainly apologize. I see there's some comments here that we're having some audio issues, and I, I 
terribly, I feel terrible about that. I do feel bad. I hope that everyone will feel comfortable reaching out to me personally at my email address here at awoods at multicopterwarehouse.com. And if you're having okay. issues with any kind of projects, I'm happy to help with those. So Don's asking if there's a certain megapixel requirement for the photos. No, there's not. I mean, you, the quality or the high, the megapixel quality of the camera will impact the clarity and the quality of the image. But I've made successful 3D models with the five megapixel um, Tello drone or the camera on the Tello. So you can really use any kind of camera. You can even use your cell phone. I was able to recently go out and do a project um, with my cell phone. Let's see, I'm happy to share with you, share with folks this. This was the Buffalo Bill grave site up in um, just outside of Denver, Colorado. And this isn't something necessarily specifically geared towards volume calculations, but kind of shows an example of how I was able to walk around an area with just my cell phone and get good enough quality detail that you can actually read as I zoom in here to the 3D mesh that was created. You can read the words William F. Cody, Medal of Honor, Indian Scout, Third U.S. Cavalry, Indian. Like you can read all the information on the headstone. And so the quality of your model will have an impact on the quality of, or the accuracy of your volume calculations that the more detail and more clarity you have in the model, the more precise the volume calculations will ultimately be as well. But this okay. is just how with about, a 12 megapixel cell phone. How about doing uh, like stockpiles, things that aren't uh, square? Things that aren't square. Okay. So I do have, a, I have the guided tour option that I can show here that this is the demo project that comes installed with PIX4D when you, if you choose the option at the, on the first screen to use a demo project, it'll create this um, quarry gravel pit here. And so in this particular example here, it's going to take a moment for, I think my image to refresh. Yeah. So if I wanted to do a stockpile of this particular location around like that, this excavator is sitting on top of here, in the cloud interface, I use the measure volume here, and I'll just come out and I'll start doing my left clicks as I move around. And so if I wanted to know how much gravel we have here on this particular spot, and we'll bring it up here to the top, I'll right click to finish. And so I get a volume there. And so when you look at the 2D view, I can only zoom in and out. I can't flip around and look at it from different perspectives. So if we look at the volume I have here from the stockpile, I can see it comes up with a value information as far as my 2D area, 3D area, perimeter, et cetera, I can calculate the volume. And then so it comes back and it shows here a cut volume of 1,121 yards and a cut error of about 50 yards, which is not too bad for that large of an area. And if I switch over now to what I'll call my 3D view, I can actually zoom in here and see specifically I kind of how that volume was defined within the point cloud here. I can see how the software is visualizing or showing with the colored pixels here, the orange or with yeah, the red and purple kind of colors showing data that was um, connected to that particular volume measurement. And then I also have the ability here to, if I want to go through and adjust the volumes that we're doing here. So if I change instead of triangulated, say maybe we change this to highest, you can now visualize here in the software. Let's go um, highest. try that one more time here. Let's try average. And in this case here, because I drew my polygon in the 2D view, it's not really updating as well. So let's go ahead and delete this volume. Now I'm in the 3D view. Let's redraw this for this area. And so if I click here along the top of the stockpile and come around the sides, and I'm just left clicking, left clicking, right clicking here, and right click to finish. And then so as that comes up, once again, I can come down here and sort of see or visualize the polygon that was drawn in that instance. And so instead of triangulated, I could do um, highest. And here now you can kind of see it's a little bit difficult, but you can see that the software does create this plane or is signifying or visualizing the plane that is currently being marked with the highest value there. So if I hit um, compute volume here, we can see now that it's doing both a, a a cut and a fill, if you will, for the area underneath. And so this is just one area here to kind of visualize within the, the software interface. And the great thing about the cloud interface, 
that project link that I shared with everybody earlier, I did that through my sharing function up here. I can hit share and the software comes up with within the cloud environment where I can share then this link to any other third party or any other outside person who may not have a PIX40 account. And then that person, once they have that link, can actually come in and do volume measurements as well. So this is a great way to share data with clients and allow them to have control of going in and clicking on and doing volume calculations themselves. Here in this particular example, you can see I am getting a volume calculation included for the um, excavator that was sitting on top of that pile. I haven't uploaded to the cloud yet the version of the um, project without, um, oh, I closed that one, all right. So if we come back in here, I can go, um, We'll see if we can't bring this up, bring up a, a new addition to this here and show you this in the desktop as well. And so yeah, we'll go here to that, that guided tour option again. So if we go out to the, the volumes calculation, it's always a good idea to do um, the point cloud classification. As I mentioned earlier here, we have the point cloud and I can show you here how the point cloud is classified. If I come in and turn on show class colors, we can see here how I've already gone through and classified this in such a way that we have all the ground classified as either yellow or gray for road surface or high veg. And I've come through and I've marked in this case here, the um, we can see that the excavator is still coming up as blue as a human made object. So in this instance, any kind of volume calculation I do will include the excavator. What I would need to do if I didn't want to include the excavator is I would first need to just come through here and essentially select the points that are the excavator. And that can be done a couple of different ways. I can just kind of cheat and look at it from an angle here in such a way that I, I'm not getting a bunch of other stuff and kind of digitize along the base of it here. And now I can simply move those to disabled and hit assign. And now that I've had that, essentially those points removed, I need to clean this up just a little bit more. I have a few more residual points there. But at this point in time, now that I've edited that, I can hit project, save project. And then I would want to, once the project saves and my changes to the point cloud have been saved, I can now rerun step three. And in step three is where we create that DSM. So we need to update the DSM to reflect the changes I've just made. And so we'd want to rerun the digital surface model here. And you don't necessarily you want to export that as a GeoTIFF and merge tiles. You don't necessarily need the ortho mosaic. And I don't have time here now to rerun step three for this particular project. But that's how you would then remove an element from a volume calculation that you don't want to be a part of it. Just make it a disabled point and it'll no longer be part of the volume calculation. Are there any other questions or concerns about doing volume calculations in PIX40? I haven't seen any other questions come in. I think that was really helpful. Uh, so yes, there will be a recording of this and you'll get an, an email, usually <clears throat> like tomorrow morning or so, but we'll, you know, it just all depends on how the system sends out the emails, but you will get an email with our contact info as well as a link to the recording of the video. So don't worry about that. If you missed anything or you want to refresh it, um, you will get a, a link to the video. So watch your emails for that. Um, thank you, Aaron. This has been really informative. Um, I didn't really know how to do some of this stuff, so it was handy for me. Uh, let's see, yeah, I think that's, um, I think that kind of covers it. Um, certainly the more megapixels, the better, or you know, the better the camera, the better, you know, you're just getting better quality data. But, you know, as Aaron said, I mean, we've both done these on pretty low, you know, end machines, 12 megapixels and, and such, but the, the better, the better, right? Mm -hmm. Most so. certainly, and also you'll find that oblique data can help make a more robust 3D model. And so I would <laughs> encourage if volume calculation, having precision there, I would encourage you to consider using three, um, some 3D data to help get more oblique data around the edges of your, broad, your model as well. Excellent. Well, thanks for joining everybody. Hope this was informative for you as it was for me. And uh, like again, recording will come out. We'll have all of our information. Oh, wait, I think we got a new question. Would you do a NADAR as well as oblique? 
Um, well, certainly on the project I shared here today and was showing the school bus project, I just did that at Nader. And so and you still get good um, elevation data with Nader. And so I, you don't necessarily have to do both, but having having both isn't a bad thing. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, well, thanks again, everybody. And uh, stay tuned for more webinars. We try and do them every week. Don't know what we have coming up quite yet for some upcoming ones, but you'll get an email with all of those as well. So thank you so much, and we'll catch you guys later. Bye-bye.